I'm going to explore the uh, creative and expressive potential of color in landscape painting today. And that's going to make my paintings better, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's get started. This is going to be a few quick tips on color. Um, you know, I have been a plein air painter for 20 some odd years. And more recently, I've moved my um, painting in a bit more color-driven abstraction. I believe a really um, important strategy and vehicle of abstracting the landscape is bringing a um, heightened kind of inventive color sense uh, to the information that we pull uh, from the landscape. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Munsell color tree how I work with uh, the Munsell system of color, um, have a couple quick notes about what I feel is kind of the unlocking of the secrets to use expressive color in the landscape. Will you tell uh, us uh, who Munsell is and give us a little bit of download? Yeah, you bet. Um, Munsell, um, Albert Munsell was a, a color theorist at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Um, like most color theorists at the time, he developed his own kind of modeling of color, uh, which is the three-dimensional kind of idea of color space. Uh, that model of Munsell's has really stood the test of time uh, because of its accuracy. And a lot of um, painting instructors uh, use it because of its really concise breakdown of the three characteristics of color, which is value, the inherent lightness or darkness of color, hue, which is the color family that a color lives in, whether it's yellow, orange, red, violet, blue, and green, and then chroma, which has to do with the intensity of color. So some colors are really intense, have a high chroma. Those colors that are a bit duller have a low chroma to them. So I'm going to talk about how I use those three main characteristics. Um, or I, what I consider the levers of color in my, in my paintings. Um, before I get to the, the model though, I wanna talk a little bit about my own plein air process. Um, I have, even though my studio paintings have taken on a um, much more color driven abstract approach to the landscape, I still do a lot of plein air painting and most of the plein air painting is done in small sketchbooks with, with casein. Casein is a milk-based paint. It's similar to gouache in that it dries quickly, uh, but it's not as readily soluble as gouache. So it allows for a bit more layering within the painting process, within what the does painting that mean? session. What, do you, what does that mean exactly? Not, ex not as much, not as soluble, meaning it, it doesn't absorb water as much? It doesn't dissolve when you lay down another wet color on top of it. It doesn't affect the color that's uh, laid down previously. Okay. Yeah. So um, this has kind of become my plein air practice. Um, this is a piece that I did last spring at a small creek, actually as a, a workshop demo. And um, that is one that I kind of worked off to prepare a small value-based study using ink in my studio. So I'm just kind of reducing that composition down into three main values driven by shape. So I've got a light, a medium, and a dark value there. It's a really great process to, I think, simplify the information that we see out into the world down into a, a really strong um, composition based on um, the interaction of big and small shapes. Um, so I think it's important, you know, when we go out into the plain air setting, it can be really um, intimidating and sometimes overwhelming because there's just so much visual information to take in all at once. And so simplifying the forms down into 
uh, major shapes, um, limiting the, ourselves to just two or three values, that exercise really leads to a really strong kind of design um, and composition in our paintings. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about one key aspect of color that really fuels my, um, my studio work. And I think it's um, a really great um, aspect of color to consider um, for you in your own work um, is the relationship between um, high chroma colors, so colors that are very intense, and their inherent value. So how light or how dark that is. So what this Munsell tree shows is basically um, 20 different hue or color families within the Munsell system. If I take, say, the yellow out of here, and I just show the yellow part of this chart, basically we've got dark yellows moving up to light yellows, in the center here, we've got muted yellows that have a low chroma. And as we move towards the perimeter, we have uh, high chroma yellows. So the aspect of what makes yellow unique is that when yellow is at its highest chroma, it is at a very light value up here. It's basically at the lightest value that is possible for that hue family. Now we contrast yellow with, say, violet, and something else happens. Violet at its highest chroma is much lower in value. So we could consider um, yellow as being a light color, vi violet as being a dark color, but to really dive into that a little bit more and to be a little bit more specific, it's that yellow at its highest chroma is light in value, whereas violet in its highest chroma is darker in value. Can you put those side by side for a second? Can you put the yellow and the purple side by side so they can get that concept? All right, so point out the higher, the highest chroma on yellow and the highest chroma on purple with your third hand. <laughs> yes, exactly. With the third hand. Um, there we go. So about right where my hand is here is basically the highest chroma in yellow. It's at the very top of that scale, denoting its light value. And then as the um, violet moves down here to its highest chroma, it is at a much lower value. So it's basically a difference between about four or five steps between where violet is at its highest chroma versus where yellow is at its highest chroma. I think that yellow tends to trick the eye a little bit because when you see that high chroma, it, to me, it looks like it would be a darker value, but it is actually a, a light value. Exactly. It's a light value. And the whole reason I bring this up is that we all, I think when we've um, start learning uh, some fundamentals with painting and especially drawing, uh, the importance of value is really kind of um, hammered into us. And of the three characteristics of color, value is the one that communicates the most visually. We can look at a photograph, a black and white photograph, a charcoal drawing, and know everything that's going on visually. Um, so value is incredibly important. And I use the, this quality of um, high chroma color and thinking about what their inherent value is to still maintain the value structure when we're being more expressive with our, with our color. Um, so color is incredibly expressive tool for paintings. It really sets the mood um, and the energy for the painting. Um, but exploring expressive color does not come at the expense of uh, value and creating a strong value structure in our paintings. Um, so that's what I did on 
this panel here. This is a um, 18 by 36 um, amber sand um, panel that I coated first with a highly colored ground, that kind of orange that you see in the middle. Um, I like to start many of my paintings with a, a real um, colorful, high colored ground to start the process. So can I ask you a question about that? You bet. All right. I don't want to interrupt. Um, no, go ahead. This is uh, so. Do you buy a ground that's already pre-colored, or do you make you, you take a white ground and put your own color in it? I take a white ground. In this case, it is um, the Alkid ground um, for oil painting that Gamblin makes, and I tint that ground with um, some oil colors. In this case, it was a combination of an orange and quinacridone red uh, to get to the specific color that I want. Um, and then I just apply that real thinly like it's another coat of ground. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so then what I've done is um, using a quinacridone magenta and a mixed violet, I'm starting to lay out that, um, that value structure in major shapes. Uh, use, just limiting myself to these three values, um, similar to my little mock-up that I've done over here. Mm -hmm. So as I start painting on this, um, I still want to maintain, you know, the lightest values in the big shape here, think moving to my middle values and then moving to my darker values around the perimeter. And um, as I expand the color range, expand the value range, um, you know, it's, it's going to really um, bring a more expressive approach to the whole painting, but still maintain that strong sense of, of design and, and value. <clears throat> We can't see your palette. Yeah, mix low. That's good. Yeah, that helps. Good. <clears throat> what was that you just put in there? So this is a fluid medium. It's a mixture of um, a Galkid painting medium and a drying oil like safflower oil to just slightly retard the drying time. And it's just a good all around medium. Um, that looks like a Princeton brush. It is a Princeton Aspen brush. Yeah, um, you can tell by the blue band. E the blue band, exactly. These are great brushes. Um, you know, they, for years I've, I was kind of looking for a brush that had enough stiffness to move the oil paint um, out of the tube, but, you know, a nice, um, you know, just soft enough to really give a versatility and mark making. And these yeah. are, these are great brushes. So even I'm going to just uh, work in some light value colors um, at the top of the painting in this kind of middle section. And the thing I want to explore with this is that I can move from one kind of hue family to another. I can move from yellows to oranges. Maybe I'll move into greens. But I still want to keep that major value shift, value family intact. Um, kind of moving in the light end of that value range. Okay, so again, you know, the colors fool the eye because if I look at that darker yellow, it's not really darker, but it it's the same value, but it reads darker for some reason. Uh, this one right here, then, yeah. yeah, it's a little bit darker than what I laid on. So it is, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about um, this whole light section of the, um, of the painting, not necessarily at one value, but maybe the, In a at value the top range. end of the value scale. Okay, good, so, that helps. Um, there's kind of a compression of values within this major shape. <clears throat> you 
you know, one really great test, I think, and I um, encourage my students to do this a lot, is once you get to a certain point in the painting, it becomes really helpful uh, to view our paintings in grayscale. Yeah. And I think a lot of painters do this now, and it's as very easy to do with our, our smartphones and devices. Um, and that basically takes hue off of the table. It takes chroma off of the table. And it's just a great way to analyze our uh, value structure as the painting during, during the painting process. So I can move from yellows to oranges into greens. But if, if you I guys have questions, say, put them in the chat. I forgot, if, Scott, there's something I should have done. Let me just go to that real quickly because I forgot. We have a prize today. Uh, the prize today is a subscription to Plein Air Magazine. Uh, you can get digital if you want it or, or print, depending on where you live. Just uh, leave a comment and um, tell us where you're watching from, and then uh, we'll pick from the comments after the replays because we always get a lot of replays, a lot of replay viewing. Thanks, Scott. You bet. So as you were announcing that, I was mix, I'm mixing up a fairly light uh, violet color, a violet that is in the same kind of hue family as um, the orange, yellows, oranges, and greens that I've already worked into this. Um, and one thing to note about violet that kind of relates to what we were talking about before and what I showed from the um, color tree is that when, when violet gets at that lighter value, it's not gonna be as strong in value or in, in chroma as the orange and the green is. But it reads like light. But it still reads nice and light because I've increased its value. I'm putting it into this value range. Um, at this part of the painting. And are you doing that also because you, it's a complementary color to yellow? Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to create some, you know, a really nice kind of sense of, of warmth, warmth in this painting and have kind of the dominant um, color strategy to be dominated by yellows, oranges, strong reds, but, you know, if, um, you know, color wise, if everything's important, then nothing's important. Right. And I try to balance out some of those really warm colors with a few uh, cool colors as well. Um, and it's basically those cooler colors that are then playing a supporting role. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you put a when you put a purple next to a yellow, it's going to make that yellow pop more. Exactly. Exactly. That's one of my other favorite um, color concepts that I love to work with and talk about in my classes is the idea of um, simultaneous contrast. So how we perceive one color differently when we place another color next to it. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that would be worth the class alone. I, I find the color is really, uh, I, I found understanding color and color harmony in the early stages of painting was very difficult. I didn't eat. People would say warm and cool. I, I didn't even know the difference. Right. And, you know, I think the, um, a lot of people can have their own kind of take on color temperature. Yeah. Um, and I think the main thing to keep in mind with color temperature, which um, is that it's all relative. You know, we never see color in a vacuum. We always see it next to something else in, in its environment. So what I find that most helpful is not necessarily thinking about is a color warm or cool, but 
in its in the context is a color warmer or cooler than mm. another color. Ah, very good. Scott is a color master, baby. <laughs> if you guys like this, make sure you share it so that your buddies can can get all this great education. You know, one thing I love about you, Scott, is that you look like you're having fun. Always. Best thing you ever Always. did was go full time as an artist. It was, it's been great. It's... You guys are allowed to buy his paintings. Where would they find them? Uh, so I have links from my website, uh, which is um, scottgalatly.com. And I sell my work exclusively um, through uh, Laura Vincent Design and Gallery okay. uh, here in Portland. Just a beautiful uh, gallery, just a really, um, she has a great program of artists and I've been really fortunate to show, show with her the last um, uh, three years. This is my fourth year showing with her. Congratulations. So I, even though I try I'm to moving, do a little abstract work in my plein air work, but this looks like a lot of fun to do these big ones. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I am always really becoming so interested in um, that space that happens between what I do in the plein air setting and what happens in the studio. Um, you know, I couldn't really do one without the other. Mm -hmm. And so plain air painting is just such a wonderful form of information gathering with mm -hmm. paint. And um, one of the ways, reasons I really like kind of simplifying that down into a small sketchbook is that for me, it really supports and really um, underscores the just pure responsive nature of plein air painting. Being outside with the paint and just visually responding to what's in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, I find that it's a very kind of pure form of, of plein air painting that way. So uh, I, I feel exactly the same way. I, once I started going outside, even though when I first uh, encountered it, it seemed like a big giant hassle. It's just the best. It really is. It really is. It's more fun. You throw some nice weather, some good friends in the mix, and... A couple of beers. It doesn't really get any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why we have, we have the plein air convention coming up. We all get together and hang out. And then we also have the plein air live coming up, which is an online conference for people who can't come to the convention. Also, Plein Air Convention is available. It's got to be, we'll be broadcasting the main stage. Um, not all the five stages, but the main stage will be online as well. Very cool. Such a great uh, event, great camaraderie. <clears throat> Lots of fun. That's why we do this. Can't take it too seriously. That's right. We're just big kids. We just want to play all day, every day. Ooh, that's a pretty color. So this is uh, mostly quinacridone red, but I'm using a bit of the cadmium orange to one to um, bring Cadmium orange is very opaque, so it's going to use it's going to be used to lighten the value of that um, quinacridone red a little bit, but not as much as say using white. White is going to um, increase that value significantly, whereas the cadmium orange is going to lighten its value slightly, but just shift it into more of a kind of middle red. And it's not going to make it pink. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there is a time and place for this, for that, but there's, <laughs> I'm definitely um, wanting to go into more of that 
middle red kind of orange uh, part of that red hue family. So as I move into kind of reinforcing these more <clears throat> middle value shapes and start thinking about the edges between my light values and my dark values, I want to move into that red, but still kind of maintain that mid value approach. All right, so I'm just kind of moving into some of these darker values. Um, you know, if I, if I bring in just those darker values, but still within those oranges and reds, they're gonna get fairly dull. And I wanna keep the chroma fairly high in this particular piece. So I'm bringing in a bit more of um, some more vibrant violets just to start to work into those darker values. Um, they can still get darker a little bit, um, still push that value range, but I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm uh, bringing in quite a bit more vibrancy, even into those darker, mm -hmm. uh, darker shadows. You know, if it's um, one thing I think that we learned from a lot of the Impressionists, um, Monet in, in particular, is that even though we um, can turn form and go from light to dark, that there can be a lot of color into uh, the shadow side of objects. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at his, his haystacks, his cathedral paintings, um, his landscapes, and he brings a lot, of exp a lot of color variation even within the shadowed areas. Now you you showed the there. Munsell chips at the beginning. Yeah. Um, how do you use them? Um, I think it's just a really great um, guide to think about that relationship between um, you know the three kind of pillars of color: um, yeah. hue, value, and and chroma. So um, as a model, like I want to think about um, maybe some dark values, like in this in this paint in this area of the painting here. Um, if I were to pull, <clears throat> are those coated in plastic so you could actually mix on top of it just to match color? Uh, they are plastic, but then the chips are right on top oh, of them. Oh, they're right on top. Okay. So you, plastic. Yeah. Let me put this on that. Although I have seen Graydon Parrish mix and match and put it on there and then yeah. wipe it off. Right. Right. Um, so if I want to explore those darker values, it's a really good way for me to kind of um, look at, say, a nice warm color being a still kind of a, in the red hue family, but moving towards violet um, that still gets some really nice chroma and color even in these dark values. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a kind of a, tar a color that I want to target with my color mixing uh, to achieve those darker value shapes in this larger painting. So and I might achieve that with some quinacridone red. Um, I use a, a, a palette that is both contains um, opaque and transparent colors. Um, uh -huh. So if I want to keep some values really nice and dark, then using transparent colors to do that allows for uh, the light to penetrate those paints and really kind of maintain their uh, their richness in dark values. Do you separate transparent versus opaque on your palette in any way, or you just keep, do it based on a color wheel? I do it based on the color wheel. So I basically lay out my colors from left to right, starting with the cadmium yellow light, I place them from left to right, 
in order clockwise around the color wheel. So okay. cad yellow to Indian yellow, cad orange, quinacridone red, ultramarine blue, cobalt teal. Okay. We're going to have to wrap up here in a minute. I apologize for that, but we're going to run no out of problem. time. That's beautiful. So what would be the next steps that you would be going through as you finish this painting? Oh, gosh. I think um, thinking about how color are, colors are starting to relate to each other. Um, one of the things that I always look for in my own paintings is look at the degree of where contrast happens. And for that, I'm looking at contrast in value, light uh -huh. against dark, contrast in chroma. You kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, violet against yellow are basically contrast in hue. And then contrast in chroma, maybe a low chroma color against a high chroma color. Cool. So when all of those things are happening and I get a nice kind of connectivity around the painting is things that I look at as to, you know, thinking about the development of the painting as it moves towards completion. Okay. I like that you're getting you're put you're, you're putting some detail in those I wouldn't say detail but the sense of detail in those darks with other darks that that make it stand out it just makes it pop makes it more interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know there's a lot of very just like I put variation in the lights I want to have variation in the darks as yeah. well. Yeah. That's outstanding. You guys liking this? Hope so. I figured you would be. Everybody likes Scott. <laughs> like one of the world's nicest guys. All right. Well, Scott, I think what we're going to do here is we're going to have to to wrap, uh, unfortunately, because we've got a time constraint today. But um, why don't you come on camera and say good goodbye real quick, or I'll come on camera and say say goodbye with you. Thanks for doing this, Scott. Thanks for having uh, you me. Have, Always a pleasure. We will post links to your website. Uh, we have already. We'll post them again. You have workshops coming up? I've got workshops. I've got a workshops and classes page on my website, both online and in person. Outstanding. All right. Well, Scott, thank you for doing this today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Very, my pleasure. Very Great helpful. Time you. flies when you're having fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>